environmental stress or agricultural stress, pesticides, water from our food, causes retarded growth, retarded development, and impairs their immune function so that they can't survive a yeast infection. A simple yeast infection. And the significance is, there's a great deal of data suggesting that infections are part of the cause for the global amphibian decline. And we're not proposing that we're refuting that hypothesis. We're saying that pesticides and environmental stress are making these animals more susceptible to diseases that otherwise wouldn't kill or otherwise would, would be fairly benign, such as pregnancy. So, and we've replicated all of this in the laboratory again. And we're now showing that the stress hormone is intermediate in these effects. And that, that's all the frog stuff. So, other questions and then... I thought that was a good place to go. Well, actually, I think that's a great place to stop. We're going to take a 10-minute break, but I have some special instructions for everyone. Like was mentioned, atrazine is water-soluble, <laughs> so you can use the restroom and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, the, uh, that's just my, my sad, geek humor. Uh, I encourage you guys to order more food, get another drink over the next 10 minutes. We'll come back. We'll go through another... Uh, round the presentation, take your questions and comments, uh, do use the restroom, uh, definitely buy more food from Atlas Cafe, who's a gracious host tonight. Let's give a, a round of applause for that. <laughs> and then say, uh, you know what, no, something's not right here. Uh, I just wanted to show this video, and it's on YouTube, and I'll post the link on my website. You can hear um, in the bad audio what you can hear and garner what you garner. Um, you can take make your own judgment. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a little exposure on it. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Haynes. Uh, thanks for that, because actually in the, in the next part of my talk, the next part of my talk, to be fair, I will periodically interject uh, the perspective from the manufacturer, just so you can get both sides of, of, of sort of a human health perspective. Before we move to the next section, are there any, are there any more questions? Because I'm actually not going to talk about frogs very much anymore. I'm going to sort of switch it up a little bit. Yes? During the break, some of us were, were wondering about sources of funding. Um, what is what has happened with your, your funding stream? Um, if you're feeling that your uh, that uh, independent funding sources are perhaps getting the message from other big people that they should not supply you funding, or if there's been no problem with that, what, what is the yeah, with that? Yeah, that's a long conversation. The short version is yes, my funding was greatly impacted. Um, uh, certainly industry is not interested in funding me anymore, but, there, but because the issue, as you'll see in a minute, because the issue became so politically hot, a lot of the federal sources, which had really supported me in a big way, dried up as well. But luckily there were other, you know, luckily we published in the important places, and we got the right kind of attention, and other both private and public sources of support became available. So it's completely changed my, my funding base. Um, but the, answer, the short answer is, yes, there was a big impact on funding, uh, but no, it did not shut us down or up. And which federal funding sources dried up when they decided that what you were doing was revealing things that they didn't want to hear? Well, our primary source before Syngenta was the National Science Foundation. And, and for a variety of reasons, they shut things down, um, some of which I think almost all of which are political. Others they have good excuses for, like they say, well, we only fund basic science and we don't fund pesticide research. Yet, more than once now, they've sent me other people's proposals which look at pesticides to review. So they're obviously inconsistent in how they apply and what they claim is the rule of the foundation. Others, yes? Yes, yeah, well, since the banning of atrazine in Europe, is there been a rebound in the amphibian populations and I don't know that anybody's really looked at what's happened to amphibian populations in in Europe since the banning of amphibian, but as well, there's so many problems. In, I mean, Europe's interesting because, of course, they deforested a long time ago. Um, 
and which created a lot of problems even before there was accuracy and there was a, a pretty big decline. And I don't know if anybody's looked specifically, at least I haven't seen any data where anybody's looked specifically at the impact. There is data, however, there are data, however, showing that their corn production and their economy was not affected by the ban of accuracy. That's been published. Tyron, when you get a question, can you restate oh, it? Oh, yes, so sir. The question is, is it bad that frogs are dying? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes for two reasons. And, and that's the whole last half of my talk. The fact that we're losing what I would argue is a sensitive indicator species, and the fact that we're losing them for reasons that would very likely affect our own development is not only bad because of the amphibians are dying, but it's also a, an indicator of general problems with environmental health that I think translate directly to problems of public health which is the, the topic of, of the last half of my talk, or not last half, last little piece. Going back to Europe, why was, if, if the research wasn't specifically regarding the amphibians, why was atrazine banned? Because there's, in Europe there's just sort of a culture of stopping everything until it's proven safe, Correct. as opposed to the other side of that of prove me wrong. Yeah. The United States essentially, so the question is why was it banned in Europe effectively? And, and, the, and the policies between Europe and the U.S. are very different. The U.S. sort of has a um, innocent to a proven guilty, with the industry having the burden of proving their own products guilty um, in the U.S. Whereas in Europe, if there's any indication that something might do harm, the, the, the European Union has officially adopt, adopted the, the so-called precautionary principle. And it says there's the potential to do harm, so you prove it safe, and until you do, it's gone. And so anything that's in the water above parts per parts per billion is no longer in use in Europe. And we, we simply do not have, do not practice that, that approach here. Okay, so that's it. This part of my talk will take will answer your question. I think it will start to get at your question and address your question a little bit as well. And I often start this part of my talk with, with this line, which I've described to many people. It's not just a line. It's the line. And, and, and I usually talk about this part of my talk as an explanation of why I crossed the line and what I mean by crossing the line. So we'll, we'll proceed from there. As an academic in the Ivory Tower, I, I, somebody asked me where I was from. So I'm a professor over at UC, University of California, Berkeley. And, and this is a quote from my advisor, who I love. I'm not knocking my advisor, by the way, but my PhD advisor when I first got involved, told me, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. And in general, that's the feeling that you get in academia, that you shouldn't get involved in sort of public or political issues. Um, and as a result, when things happen like the EPA hearings and the congressional hearings, most scientists who have shown the kinds of things that I've shown don't show up to present or to testify. Whereas the scientists that are paid by industry, well, let me just show you the kinds of things that happen. The reason that I cross the line and do things a little bit differently are the following. The first one is, my eyes are bad enough, I'm not going to be able to read this, but the first one, the first reason that I cross the line, I go to my mom. And as I used to point out, this is not my mom, she's much better looking than this, but, but I'll tell you what this has to do with my mom. This is Jamie Foxx. It's the cover of New York Times Style Magazine. And let me just see here if I can read this. Okay, so inside, this was in 2006, there was an article called Sip of the Iceberg, and it was an article on ice ones. And the article starts off, there was a huge controversy several years ago in the science world when an endocrinologist discovered that exposure to a common wheat killer atrazine caused male frogs to develop female sex organs. Then it goes on. Men who want to explore a verified move of ice wines, so it's richly textured, frozen on the vine wines, take heart, your sex organs will play. So there's this incredibly ridiculous article about ice wines. It starts off talking about, obviously, my work. Here's why it's a tribute to my mother. When I first published this stuff, and the reason I pointed out, I wasn't bragging, the reason I pointed out that we published in Proceedings in National Academy of Sciences, we published in Nature, we published in Environmental Health Perspective, our work was written up in science, is because these are the most prestigious journals, in, in not just the biological sciences, but in science. And the reason I point that out is, is how we measure ourselves in academia. So I had this experience where I called my mom when we first published in these big fancy journals. And I said, Mom, this is the most important stuff I've ever published. 
And my mom sort of, you know, she's sort of listening. Up. And the next week, my mom called me back and she says, you know, I love you, son. I don't want to hurt your feelings. She said, but how important are those publications that you were talking about? She said, I went to Barnes & Noble and they never heard of those magazines. Aww. And it was one of those things that made me realize that you know, we measure ourselves as academics in ways that mean nothing to 99.99% of the world. Just the thought that my mother can't go get a copy of what I think is my most important publication and it's on an issue that I think is relevant to her life, to all of your lives. But unless you're part of the academia, part of the Ivory Tower, you don't have access. So I use this to represent that because my mom didn't even have to go by it. It showed up on our doorstep. And so the fact that, and again, something that's looked down in academia, the fact that my work has ended up in this sort of popular venue means something very special to me. The other reasons I crossed the line are the following. This is a quote, and I'm going to show you Tim Pasteur. We'll see his name over and over again. He's a representative from Syngenta. And in and, and 2005, when I first testified before the legislature, he was quoted in the newspaper as saying, he's taking his information to people who don't have enough independent information to make a truly independent decision. In other words, he was calling the people of Minnesota stupid. But lines like this made me cross the line. And again, I'll tell you what I mean by crossing the line in a minute. Because I figured if the industry didn't want me to do what I was doing, then it must be the right thing to do. So this was instrumental in me changing my approach. Another thing that was instrumental in me changing my approach is even though my PhD advisor said the following, my original advisor had a different way of looking at <laughs> my dad. Because here's what was happening. While I was letting the science speak for itself, Syngenta was putting out press releases like the following. Research that we have funded does not support the conclusions that Hayes is drawing from his own research. And somebody asked me this earlier, the implication was I was the only one showing problems with anthracene and wildlife and other organisms. In fact, once they did publish their own research and it was peer reviewed and published, here's, remember my hermaphrodite? Here's theirs, two testes, more ovaries, large testes. They got the same kind of effect that, that we got in our research. If you look at the number, they got the same amount. Actually, they got even more sexual abnormalities in their studies than I got. But they were going to the public making press releases that suggested that I was the only one who showed these negative effects of atrazine. And, and if you're sticking with the p-values, they even got better statistics than we got. I wish I had numbers like that. So, a couple other, again, different perspective. Here's one of the other things that sort of, and we're going to start to move away from amphibians after this, is if you go through the literature, okay, if you go to PubMed or wherever you search the scientific peer-reviewed literature, what you would find is there are 38 published studies that show that anthracene has adverse or negative effects on amphibians. Not just my work. There's 38 studies total. What the EPA has done is sort of reduce those studies. The first way they did it was, here's a quote from the EPA. For their scientific advisory panel meeting, it says, EPA plans to include only those studies that tested anthracene alone. A very unrealistic scenario. But even if we accept that, even if we eliminate five studies that looked at pesticide mixtures, there's still 33 published peer-reviewed studies that show negative effects on amphibians produced by 20 different laboratories. Not just mine, 33 published papers. Those negative effects, and I'm just going to go through these quickly, show everything from general toxicity, uh, decreased growth from atrazine alone. Here, here's one that shows decreased survivability just from atrazine alone. And again, these aren't my studies, these are others. This one showed reduced gonad size, so it caused frogs' testicles to shrink, published by a group in Canada. And totally, if you look at all 38 studies, atrazine causes general toxicity, immune failure, neurotoxicity, adverse behavior, retarded growth, retarded development, and of course, as I've talked about, sexual deformities. And I've color-coded them there so that you can see all the different studies that show these effects. There are only nine published studies that suggest that atrazine has no effects. All of them were funded by Syngenta, and all of them were produced by the same laboratory, whereas none of the, the studies that show effects were funded by Syngenta. In fact, I don't know how much you know about statistics, but normally when you do statistics, anything less than 0.05 is considered significant. So you can run a statistic on this and ask, what type of effect does the funding source have 
on whether or not atrazine has negative effects. And you get an incredible, you get this incredible peak value. So, you, so you can, I'm not making this up. So you can, you can look at the publications yourself, and you can do these statistics, and you get this incredible number. So who funds the study has a profound effect, but what's more is all the studies that show no effect have focused on negotiating. And what the EPA did, in their great wisdom, was ignore all these 38 studies with all these variety of effects and concluded that studies of the potential for atrazine to cause adverse effects, other than or in addition to amphibian canal development, were not considered by the scientific advisory panel. In fact, in the end, they decided that peer-reviewed, published scientific papers were not good enough and they could only use studies that were funded by the manufacturer and conducted with EPA oversight. So they eliminated 38 studies and looked at only one Syngenta-funded EPA study and concluded that atrazine does not have a, na a negative effect on the figures. You can look it up. It's on their webpage. I wouldn't make this kind of stuff up. So here's a different, I mean, here's a, again, I told you, I'm going to give you Syngenta's perspective. So Syngenta's perspective is here. The EPA has effectively concurred with it. Here are the real reasons that I crossed the line. And people have made reference to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. I often title this talk from Silent Spring to Silent Night. And the answer, whoever asked me the question about, is our frogs disappearing bad? And the same way that Rachel Carson suggested, your question actually, and the same way that Rachel Carson suggested that the pending Silent Spring, the death of birds as a result of pesticide exposures, was an indication of a general environmental health failure which will lead to public health failure. I firmly believe that the global amphibian decline, which is real, scientists aren't arguing about this anymore, and the role that pesticides are playing, and I don't think, again, as I showed you, I think pesticides are an intricate part of an important web, not the sole cause, but I think that the effect of pesticides, and in particular atrazine, their effects on frogs are telling us something about environmental health in general, and, as I'll show you, about public health that should bring concern to everyone in this room. I'd like to open this part of the talk with this slide from Uganda, Nabogabu, Lake Nabogabu, where the agricultural runoff from this crop, which goes into these containers, which is the sole source of drinking, cooking, and bathing water for this village. I argue with this slide that these men in this village, who don't have a fancy EPA, who in many cases don't have the fancy education that we all have, but these men in this village are connected enough that they clearly see the impact and the connections between environmental health and public health. I can guarantee you that if I told these men in this village that, you know, the frogs in this water, if I told them that the frogs in this water had eczema testes and no immune system, I guarantee you the connection would be clear. Whereas if you look at my village, and I live somewhere here, my water just comes from here. It's not all that different, except I don't have to cart a yellow container up there and get the water every day. It comes out of the faucet. But we're fooled. We're tricked. Because we think that the fancy EPA won't allow anything to come out of our faucet that might be harmful to us. And what I'm arguing with you is that's not the case. That atrazine alone, just one chemical, is allowed at levels that are 30 times higher than what causes sexual deformities in frogs. And now what about people? Glenn Fox wrote, in echoepidemiology, so the study of diseases in wildlife, the occurrence of an association of more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. In other words, if you show an effect in more than one species, it's probably not just a correlation or a coincidence. There's probably some cause and effect relationship. We've talked about multiple species of amphibians, which, according to this philosophy, is strong evidence. But similar effects occur in fish, which I won't have time to talk to you about today, but testosterone levels decline, estrogen levels go up, you get sexual problems. There's similar problems in turtles and alligators and in birds that are published. Over 40 papers have been published. I am going to talk to you about effects in mammals. We're going to talk about laboratory rats, human cell lines, and human epidemiology. And I just want to point out the EPA has an I Hate Tyrone webpage. And on page 10 of their site, their quote, I'm quoting them, they say there is no direct scientific information to assess the hypothesis that anthracene turns on aromatase and is harmful to humans. But I'll show you why that's not true. So the first part of my, hypo not my hypothesis is that anthracene causes a reduction in testosterone and sperm production. 
We know that it does this in frogs. I already showed you the data. So what is the evidence now that it does it in other animals? If you look at rats, it's already been published in the year 2000 by a group in Europe. Atrazine causes testosterone to decline and sperm count goes down. So that we've shown this in frogs, others have shown this in fish. Now we see the same thing in rats, which are mammals like us. There's a peak value. If you're crazy about statistics, I'll give Another publication in Shauna Swan looked at humans in Columbia, Missouri. Here's what she found. If you compare control men, so men who have children, have no problems getting their wife pregnant, with men who have low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant, there's significantly more atrazine in the men who have low fertility, men who can't get their wives pregnant. So here's the so what you have to do is I'm going to show you all these data, and you have to be convinced that it's all a coincidence. Okay. What this says, what this shows you is that men who have low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant have above 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. In other words, these men with low sperm count had the same amount of atrazine in their urine that we use to chemically castrate and drive the sperm down in frogs and in fish. Here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to think about. Now closer to home. This is in Columbia, Missouri. The data is still there. I've changed the, the y-axis. Because in 1993, a study was conducted in California that showed that here are atrazine levels in the urine of field workers. And I've changed the axis again. Here are atrazine levels from the same study in men who apply atrazine. 2,400 parts per billion. So in other words, men who apply atrazine to fields in California have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we know is associated with low fertility and low sperm count in humans. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we use to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. In other words, one of these guys could pee in a bucket, I could dilute it 24,000 times, and I could use their urine to chemically castrate and make hermaphrodites out of 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. But nobody has any idea what the impact is on their health, because in California, agricultural workers are 99% Mexican or Mexican-American. Average education, sixth grade, life expectancies of 50. Okay? Are you kidding? The life expectancy of a migrant worker is 50? 50. Yes. Where, where is that data from? Uh, I can get you data. There are data from Minnesota as well as in California. And I can also send you a website that summarizes access to health care, etc. Most of that, though, is based on documented workers. That's not even an issue on non So it's potentially lower. <laughs> no, it's potentially higher. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, potentially lower, yes. The life expectancy. Yeah. Correct. That is shocking. I've never heard that. I can, I can send you the data. Or I can send you to a website. I, in the end, I'll show you where you can actually get access to it as well. Before you go on, do you Here's have, a different perspective. Yes. Is there any data on the fertility of those? Zero. Well, that Zero. So all they've done is measure what's there. And in fact, the Center for Disease Control now suggests that that's an underestimate because they haven't measured the right metabolism. So that's probably an underestimate in terms of the levels that are up there. But there's been no follow-up as far as I know. So again, different perspective. Just so that I'm being fair to the other side. Here's the other side of the equation. The other side of the equation is, is aromatase induced by atrazine, as we've seen in frogs and fish and turtles and alligators? And does that lead to excess estrogen, which causes egg production? Those are fancy words for egg production. And how is that related to breast cancer and prostate cancer in humans, which we now know to be estrogen dependent? Here's blood levels of testosterone in rats. Again, it goes down, and there's a concomitant increase in estrogen in those same exposed rats. So again, just like we see in frogs, fish, alligators, turtles, testosterone goes down, estrogen goes up. And here's what's interesting. This publication was published by the Environmental Protection Agency. So this work was done in an Environmental Protection Agency laboratory. The same Environmental Protection Agency that says there's no data to test the hypothesis. Okay? So exactly what I've shown you in frogs, what I can show you has been published in fish, Turtles and alligators occurs in rats, which are now a lot closer to us. 
in rats, this paper is actually published from a Syngenta laboratory. And what they showed was not only does estrogen go up in rats, but there's a p-value, but the incidence of estrogen-dependent breast cancers in rats that drink or eat anthracene are increased. And what they say in the paper was, they say, well, there's no increase in the incidence in breast cancer, but just a change in the age of onset. In other words, they argue that if the controls live long enough, they get the same breast cancer. But that's like saying, well, you're going to die anyway. We're just making it happen a little bit more. <laughs> but this is from the company. Okay? In humans, as early as 2001, a paper was published, and you're going to look on the y-axis at aromatase activity. And remember, aromatase goes up in frogs, it goes up in fish, it goes up in turtles, alligators, chickens, rats. This is human cancer cells now. There's controls normalized to one. If you take a human cancer cell and expose it to atrazine, it expresses aromatase and starts making estrogen. Just like we've seen in frogs, just like we've seen in fish, just like we've seen in rats, turtles, and alligators. Okay? Say that again. So if you take a, so let's go back. If you take a tadpole and expose it to atrazine, it makes aromatase and estrogen. If you now take a human cell, and expose it to anthracene, it does the same thing. It starts making aromatase, and it starts making estrogen. Okay? And in a study as early as 1997, and again, if you're crazy about it, with a p-value of 0.0001, that means there's only a 0.01% chance that the relationship is random. Okay? A study in Kentucky showed that women who live in areas where the well water is contaminated with anthracene, were much more likely to develop, breast, to develop breast cancer when compared to women who live in the same areas but don't drink their water, but have another source of drinking water. So again, you have to be convinced that these things are all coincidences. Tadpoles, fish, turtles, alligators, rats, human cells all make estrogen when exposed to anthracene. The frogs and fish become hermaphrodites or become complete females, which is estrogen dependent. The rats and the humans develop breast cancer which is estrogen dependent. Now I'm going to talk to you about prostate cancer. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to read to you because the company has actually publicly accused me of misrepresenting the data that I'm going to tell you about. So a study was conducted about four years ago in a Syngenta factory in Louisiana. The study looked at the incidence of prostate cancer in one of their own factories in a community that's 80% black. The reason I'm pointing that out is because blacks are two and a half times more likely to die from prostate cancer than white males. So in a company in San Pedro, Louisiana, where they make anthracene and Syngenta's own factory, they studied prostate cancer incidents and published it in the International Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health, published by the National Institutes of Health. They wrote, so I'm reading to you so you know that I'm not misrepresenting anything. They wrote, quote, the increase in all cancers combined seen in the overall study group was concentrated in the company employee group. See, they never say it's Syngenta. They always call it the company. But it's Syngenta. They're the only ones who make it. They wrote, quote, the increase in prostate cancer in male subjects was concentrated in company employees. They wrote, quote, the prostate cancer increase was further concentrated in actively working company employees. So if you actually go to work, you're more likely to develop prostate cancer. They wrote, quote, all but one of the cases occurred in men with 10 or more years since hire. So the longer you work for the company bagging atrazine, the more likely you are to develop prostate cancer. They wrote, quote, analyses restricted to company employees also found that the prostate cancer increase was limited to men under 60 years of age. So for those of you who don't know, prostate cancer, which is the number two cancer in men, is something you get when you're over 65. All of these men, except one, were 50 years old. And in fact, if you look at the data, there's an 8.4 fold increase in prostate cancer in their company. 8.4. All in men who were actively working, all in men who had been there 10 years or more, except one case, and all in men who were all under 65 or under 60. Hang on, hang on one second. Yes. Is that the total number of, uh, of cases, no. or is that it's that's, that's rate? The, that's the rate. That's the observed over the inspected for the oh. incident. So that's not the number. So it's 8.4 full time. What was it, how many subjects? That number I don't remember. Is it over 100? Do you, do you even 
I don't remember. I, okay. I, no, I don't think it's over 100, but I don't remember precisely. Okay. Again, just another, just so you know what their perspective is. So the evidence is there, and it's not just more than one species of amphibian. It's a common mechanism with endpoints, with effects that are consistent with that mechanism, despite, again, what the EPA says to, to the public. So the next question is, and again, something that I have to admit I still get excited about academically, is how much are our developmental, I guess sort of answer your question, how much are our developmental studies in this aquatic organism really telling us about this aquatic organism? And I would argue it's very difficult to show that exposure in utero to atrazine is causing effects 40, 50 years, or even 10 years down the road. But we can do developmental studies in amphibians that allow us to make those kinds of predictions, as well as in rats. At the same time, we've been using human cells, at any rate, to tell us things that we can't study in amphibians. So for example, and I won't give you the details, inside the cell, we now know the molecular events that lead to overexpression of aromatase. There's binding to something called phosphodiesterase in the cytoplasm, and actually binding to and or activation of a transcription factor in the nucleus that helps the gene get turned on inappropriately. And what's interesting is, even though we've studied this in a human cell, in human cells, we now know that the sequence and the regulation of frogs, fish, turtles, alligators is exactly the same DNA sequence that you find in humans. So again, the developmental effects that we find in frogs help us understand developmental effects in humans, but the cellular and molecular studies that we're doing in human cells are helping us understand what happens in wildlife. In fact, part of my lab now is working directly on breast cancer cells. And all I'm going to say about this is what this band on this gel is showing is that the gene for aromatase, and you'll see the relevance of this in a second, the gene for aromatase is upregulated by atrazine. This is now in human breast cancer tissue, the number one cancer in women, and cancer being the number two cause of death in women. In addition, the transcription factor I told you about is turned on in these cells, in these breast cancer cells, and the estrogen receptor is turned on in these breast cancer cells. And here's the significance of those things. And in fact, this, this set of slides are the slides that I call the truth, that I want you to walk away with. And, and I'm confident in saying the truth because it's nothing that's coming from me. The source of the information I'm going to give you, I'll reveal in just a minute. Cancer is when a cell, you see it's red, so you know it means bad. Cancer is when a cell loses growth control, it grows out of control. By definition, that's what cancer is. In the case of breast cancer, that growth is promoted by the estrogen receptor, almost like a lock and key. When estrogen binds to this pocket in the cell, it stimulates it to grow. Which, when you're first growing your breasts at puberty, it's, that's okay. But when it stimulates your breast cells to grow out of control, again, it leads to cancer and that's, and that's bad. For a long time, here was the mystery about breast cancer, because I just told you that it's estrogen dependent and 70% of all women, but most women get breast cancer after menopause. So what kind of sense does that make? We now know that breast cancer ex cells express aromatase, and they make their own estrogen. And that estrogen stimulates those cells to grow and turn into a tumor. So women with breast cancer don't have higher blood levels of estrogen. They make their estrogen locally, and that causes those cells to grow out of control. Here's why this is true. We now understand the role of aromatase. Remember, if you know nothing else, you know what aromatase is now, right? We now so much understand the role of aromatase that the treatments now for the number one cancer in women for breast cancer is a chemical that knocks out aromatase that blocks estrogen so that your breast cancer doesn't grow. Just think about that for a second. One company is selling you a chemical to block aromatase to treat breast cancer, while another company is exposing up to 70% of all Americans to a chemical that does exactly the opposite. Here's why I say that this is true. This isn't coming from me. Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. The same company that sold atrazine to us for 58 years, the same, since 1958, not 58 years, the same company that's been selling 80 million pounds of atrazine since 1958 makes a chemical that blocks aromatase. 
Not that you might say it's true. If you go to their website, on one, one website, they'll say, oh, atrazine turning on aromatase has nothing to do with breast cancer. Haze is crazy. If you go to the other website, they'll say, oh, blocking your aromatase is how we're going to treat your breast cancer. So imagine if you're living in the Midwest taking letrozole to treat the number one cancer in women when your water is contaminated with a chemical that does exactly the opposite. This, when I realized this, and I can show you other examples, this made me cross the line. And again, I'll tell you what I mean by crossing the line. Part of it is I want to encourage you that when you leave here tonight to write to Syngenta, to write to Novartis, and ask them, how can they sell a pesticide that is the most common contaminant of ground surface and drinking water in the country. And turn around and sell a compound that does exactly the opposite and tell you that that's the way to treat your breast cancer. And now they're trying to market it for prostate cancer as well. Can we pause yeah. to actually take some comments from the audience or sure. questions from the audience? Absolutely. Because this is the part, I've actually seen this, this entire presentation before. This is the part where I swore at my screen. This is the part where that got me, that brought me to life. Uh, so I invite, like, what do you think about the conflict of interest that he just introduced? Are there any comments or questions up to this point? If you can yell. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's any way we can remove it. I'm like, Britta, pure. I'll get if we buy bottled water, I'm like, how, how can I help myself quick? Um, First of all, your fiance works in water treatment, so you should know the answer. Can you uh, you know what? I, I want to come back to that in a moment. Okay. That's one of my least, I, I appreciate the questions, one of my least favorite questions, and I'll say why I mean. I'll, 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 I'll give you an easy way to get rid of it, I think. Yeah, thank you. So this is more of a basic question. Um, so I is aromatase all bad or no? Does, if so it does have normal function in sure. the food body, just when it's out of control. Yeah. So, so for example, aromatase is expressed in the ovary, and so every month when you go through a menstrual cycle, it's the estrogen production that causes the lining of your uterus to build up. It's estrogen production that causes your breast to grow at puberty. It's when you express it, like any gene, it's when you express it inappropriately. If you're a male, for example, and you express it and make estrogen, it causes problems. If you're a female and you express it inappropriately and damage breast tissue, that's what leads to uh, breast cancer or uterine cancer. Or if you express uh, aromatase inappropriately in your uterus during pregnancy, it causes you to have an abortion, to lose the pregnancy, which I'll talk about. But at the same time, aromatase is important for making strong bones. You need estrogen to make your house. So it's inappropriate, or it's a hormone imbalance that causes the problem. So no, estrogen is not bad. Like any hormone, it's bad, though, when it's at the wrong time and in the wrong place. And in full disclosure, uh, two months ago we had a science cafe on Vioxx. Mm -hmm. And we had a doctor come in and basically talk about Vioxx, which is this anti-arthritic drug that ended up being proven to show that it caused heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And the process by which the company, Merck, uh, which uh, personally for disclosure I actually hold a lot of stock in, but uh, <laughs> uh, ended up covering up the fact that this caused heart attacks. And uh, it's a stark uh, analogy between what you just showed, between what Novartis is doing and what Merck did yeah. in terms of the conflict of interest. So if you're curious about how this operates on a level that's been exposed and legislated against, uh, which is the case of Vioxx, which has been proven, legislated against, there's been uh, jury awards against it. So it's out in the open. Uh, you can check out that presentation from December. Uh, it's called Art of, uh, <laughs> Is Big Pharma Good or Bad for Us? Yeah. And I, I've used that same analogy to Vioxx. In fact, I've often entitled my talk, Is Atrazine the EPA's Vioxx? For that same reason, there are a lot of parallels. So this is not unique. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions before we go on. What about the role of EPA? What about the role of EPA? Uh, well, I'm sort of working through that. <laughs> it depends on whether or not you mean EPA, the Economic Protection Agency, or the Environmental <laughs> Protagonist Agency, or the Environmental Protection Antagonist. I mean, it depends on who. <laughs> um, the e we can. We, I'll talk about that more. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what the EPA's position is. So, what happens when you give the drug to the fraud? 
that's what I want to do. But as you can imagine, I can't get my hands on it. So, so not only, you mean, so can we, so what I really want to do, exactly, that's, that's one of the experiments we want to do. We also want to, in our memory cancer cell lines, look at how much atrazine it takes to reverse the effect of the drug and vice versa. But as you can imagine, it's difficult for me to get. Um, and in one case, I actually gave a talk, and there was a woman in the audience who said, I'm on the drug, and I'll send it to you, but, you know, there's yeah. problems with how, you know, we have to get it through right. legitimate. Otherwise, we can't publish it, and it sort of defeats the purpose. But you can imagine they ain't going to send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes? If you uh, look at maps of the distribution of breast cancer in the United States, how well does that correlate with the red state uh, map? That People haven't done it. One of the things, we, so one of the things we'll talk about at the end is every time I give this talk, for example, there's always somebody who says, my mother, my aunt, you know, they always have anecdotal stories. But as you can imagine, there's no team who would go out and see if that's a real, you know, if that's a real problem or if it's just anecdotal. But one of the things I was at a meeting this weekend, we're raising money now to start something that I call a downstream institute whose job it would be to, to do just that. If you're living in a neighborhood and you've got know, lots of people sick and there's chemicals here and nobody's doing the test, we want to have a team of scientists and an endowment that will allow us to go see, oh, is it you know, just paranoia or is there really something going on? But right now, there are a couple studies coming out that look at um, uh, incidences of, of certain types of abnormalities and learning disabilities that show correlations with when those babies were conceived and peak levels of atrazine. But you can imagine the difficulty is in showing that early exposure to a chemical causes you to get breast cancer when you're 50. They've done it in rats, but you know, you're looking over a few years in rats. And it's only this year, for example, with DDT, that somebody's actually done the epidemiology to show that DDT exposure before the age of 14 leads to an increased breast cancer risk at age 50. That was only published just, just the last couple of months. So one, you have to have somebody who's looking at the problem. And two, it's a more difficult thing to prove than humans. But we have good, not just amphibian models, but really good rat models. And I'll show you some of those that make those predictions. Let's take one more question, and then we'll fire through to the end and invite a lot more questions. Does the FDA and the EPA talk to each other? And yeah, FDA wouldn't get involved in, in, in this one. So FDA, Food and Drug Administration, would get involved in food supplements and drugs, but anything that's applied to the pesticide falls under the EPA. Well, that's what the uh, well, but they wouldn't be looking at lectures. They would be looking at lectures to make sure it works. They wouldn't then turn over and look at the atrazine issue. That, that would really be all the EPA. And, and come on, her FDA, uh, one government agency cooperating with another just independently? Come on. I'm just joking. So, so somebody was asking about EPA. There's the EPA. I mean, I showed you now peer-reviewed published data both for effects on amphibians, and now there's over 40 papers on atrazine as an endocrine disruptor in mammals and in humans related to these effects. And, and again, there's the EPA's perspective as of 2008. In fact, in the end, I'm going to tell you how to write to the EPA. This is an excerpt from the, from the form letter that they're going to send back to you if you write to them on this issue. That's their position. So here's the EPA's response. The EPA's response is they would take a tiered model, or what they call a tiered model, to address atrazine's effects. And that would involve basically repeating everything that's already been published. So 38 studies in amphibians, over 40 studies in mammals linking it to cancer. And as I said, they pay for one study, Syngenta paid for one study that was overseen by the EPA, and they claim that that study trumps all amphibian studies and effectively all mammalian and human studies, and now it's done. Was Even that if peer reviewed? Uh, no, it's not peer reviewed. No, it, it's strictly an EPA study report. So. In addition, even if they have found an effect, Everything that's been published now, all those papers would have had to have been repeated by industry funding and overseen by the EPA, a, a, a tier model that they're suggesting would take over 40 years. I mean, essentially, in terms of, and again, I'll tell you what I mean by crossing the line. It was my opinion that even if we accept the EPA's model for how to evaluate the accuracy, it's my opinion that we don't have 40 years to wait for them to repeat things that are already in the peer-reviewed public, published literature. And in fact, as I'm about to show you now, many things that have been done and published already by the EPA's own laboratories. So for example, I told you about rat studies that show that atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer, and there are similar studies associating atrazine with these effects in humans. There are several published studies showing that atrazine causes immune failure. 
The ones that bring me more concern are that there are laboratory rodents showing that atrazine causes neural damage. So rats that are exposed in utero, their pups don't learn as well, they're hyperactive. There's a study now coming out showing similar effects in humans, showing that babies that were conceived during peak atrazine exposure have learning disabilities and hyperactivity as much as eight, nine years down the road. But what's more significant, I think, and what concerned me more is that there's studies showing that atrazine causes abortion in four strings of rats. And now there are human studies showing what the mechanism probably is. It concerns me because these studies were published and conducted by an EPA laboratory. The same EPA that says there's no data to test the hypothesis. Another EPA laboratory now published several studies that show of those rats that don't abort, when they give birth to sons, the sons are born with prostate disease or prostate cancer. So not only does atrazine cause prostate cancer, and I showed you the human data, but atrazine in the mothers leads to prostate disease in the pups, the male pups, when they grow up. It's a second EPA laboratory. Another EPA laboratory showed that atrazine causes impaired breast development in the daughters if the mothers don't abort. And here's what that looks like. So here's a normal breast. All these buds should develop to, to grow into the breast. Here's what that looks like if you're exposed to atrazine. That same EPA laboratory showed that when those rats with the impaired breast development grow up, their grandchildren have impaired growth and development because the mothers are incapable of feeding them properly and they show up with neural damage, undernourished and uh, uh, associated neural impairment. So it, this is, these are the things that really got me concerned about what role as a scientist I was playing. Because here, if you look at the rat model, we've seen rat models predict human effects over and over again, whether we're talking about DES or DDT and its role in cancer. And here we have a model that shows that this rat is affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. This rat never saw atrazine. But this rat suffers from impaired growth, development, and neural damage because its mother has impaired breast development because her mother was exposed to atrazine, two generations away. And so when you consider this, when you consider atrazine will be in the groundwater for at least 10 years, even if we stop using it today, when you consider these studies in rats that suggest affects two generations down the road, this concerned me because when I think about my own daughter, for example, that the potential impact, not just on environmental health, but on public health, has nothing to do with me and you. We've already been exposed. Maybe not you personally, but I mean our generation has already been exposed. Our children have already been exposed. Our grandchildren, based on the true half-life of atrazine, will be exposed. And these rat studies are showing us that our grandchildren's grandchildren will be affected by atrazine that we're applying today. Here's what the EPA said. This was, a, this was published in the Oakland Tribune, 2006. With all this mumble jumbo about the science and the 40 year worth of studies they have to do and how important the weight of the evidence is, they said in the newspaper, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. Here's what I mean by crossing the line. You've seen all the reasons now. I gave this talk a couple years ago. And a woman came up to me after. I forget. It was a similar venue to this. I mean, it was a very broad audience. You know, not a university or a med school. Audience. And a woman came up to me and she said, Dr. Hayes, that was a great talk. She said, but it was only half a talk. I said, what do you mean it was only half a talk? She said, you told us what to do. Or she said, you told us what the problem is, but you didn't tell us what to do. And my response, guided by my PhD advisor, was, that's not my job. I gave you the science. You have to figure out what to do for yourself. And it's sort of all the stuff we've done since I showed you the picture of the line. All the things that I thought about it made me realize that if the people with the science who are involved in the science don't take a role as advocates, then, then we really aren't being fair to, to, we really aren't delivering what we have to offer. So I crossed the line in the sense that I hope I've given you the science. That's the first half of my talk. The last half of my talk is telling you what you need to do. And the answer to the Brita drinking water, there's my website. <laughs> the answer to the Brita drinking water question is, 
Um, yes, if you put a Brita filter on your water, it will take anthrazine and all the pesticides out that I talked about. But that doesn't help the environmental issue because you can't put a Brita filter on a river or a lake or on rainwater. That doesn't help the people who are most affected because even if the farm workers and factory workers have money and access to water filters, those 24,000 time levels that we talked about in Europe, that comes across the skin and the population. So the people who are most at risk, even if they have access, Brita filter would not help them. The best way to get anthracene out of your water is not to have it there in the first place. So if you go to this website, all the papers that I talked to you about, I have summaries that you can read. You, you can click onto the YouTube. Um, but more importantly, in terms of what you can do, you can click right on to Syngenta and ask them the questions that I brought up here. How can you, Syngenta and Novartis, sell a chemical that turns on aromatase and a chemical that turns, on, that turns it off? You can click right onto the EPA and email them directly. And I showed you part of the mumble jumble they're going to send you back. And you can click right on to U.S. Congressman Keith Ellis' email because he's written a bill to not only ban, but criminalize the use of anthracene. And I never thought I would say this, but every person who's informed who clicks onto that email will make a difference in whether or not that bill just sits there in Congress or whether or not the bill actually gets through the floor. So by crossing the line, I mean, I've told you what the problem is. What you can do about it is not by a great filter. It's not by bottled water. But to get this stuff out of the water and send the EPA a message that you really want an agency that actually protects the environment. Thank you. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity for questions. I just want to share my experience of going through all this because I I don't book speakers lightly. I do a research and I read uh, for about three weeks about atrazine. My fault. <laughs> Uh, I read about atrazine, I looked at Syngenta's response, uh, Syngenta's response to Dr. Hayes. This takes me back to the bias discussion. This really, really takes me back there. I have not been this mad about something since that discussion. Because it strikes at the heart of what I see as the pearl in scientific research, which is its integrity. It's about the science. And when I saw that uh, Novartis, at the same time as basically introduces an aromatase inhibitor and markets an aromatase uh, inducer into the marketplace, the conflict of interest was overwhelming. It was basically like sitting there looking at the bias research. And I've, I've never been this mad. And I don't want to color what you guys feel about it. But I gotta tell you, after reading, and I looked at signage of papers, they're really fucking convincing. They are. They, I, like, there's no doubt about it. But what I wanna say to you is like, you being educated about it is the difference in the world. This is the reaction I had. What I'm interested in is the reaction you have. We're not bound by academic principles. Scientific integrity, not making a judgment, we're not. We're blessed with the fact that we can have an emotional reaction. We can have a response. We can care. Dr. Hayes is he's bound in a way. So what I actually want to invite people to do, in addition to asking their questions in a wrap up, is what is your reaction to all of this? No way to, and I invite the skeptic's response. If you don't believe it, say it. You know, uh, this is not a forum for you to just blindly believe what, what has been said up here. If you dissent, I want to hear it. But go beyond the question. I want to hear what you have to say, because that has an impact on the people around you. So I'm going to open the floor to questions and comments, and what you think about the evening. Oh, I'm a friend. Go ahead. Um, I'm I, I don't know much about how the EPA works, but I suspect it's a pretty large organization. Surely there are people within the EPA who see through the top 10 people who are telling the Bush administration for them. Yeah. How come we're not hearing from them? Um, when we did hear from them, I think, like, I forget her name now, the former head of the EPA, 
they end up leaving. Yeah. He's a moderate Republican, former governor of New Jersey. She was asked pressure to resign. And and the problem is the top people in the EPA are political appointees. So, for example, Region 9 EPA here in California, I have a great relationship with them. They fly me to Guam to give talks and things like that. But the top, top people are all political appointees. And to give you another example, and you can go, you can click on the website and learn about this as well. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, a state agency, when the bill came up in Minnesota to ban atrocity, they asked the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to testify. Because this is an agency who's you know, taxpayers' money, their job is to monitor pesticides, and the legislature wanted to know how much atrazine contamination is out there. When the guy Paul Watska asked him to testify, they told him no. He gave the data to the legislature so that they could have it, because they told him he couldn't show up. Then they accused him of stealing data and fired him. There's a whistleblower lawsuit right now for he and another worker from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency who wanted to just talk about the levels that were out there, nothing else. Right? So there are people inside the EPA that I get letters from, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, USGS, but all the top people are political appointees. Okay? And I have a lot, I, mean, I get confidential phone calls all the time where they look, I can't send you this information, but here's what's going on, I'll be fired. In, in disclosure, I was investigating that Paul Watzka uh, uh, reference, and according to the Minnesota State of Agriculture, whatever, whatever that department is, they claim that he falsified or released uh, unavailable data when he was working for the Department of Agriculture. And then they have been investigating him before he released the atrazine data. That's what the claim is. I, and the reason I say that is because I want to be honest with you guys. I want you to know the facts of what the state says as well. The timing of it is in question. That's, that's the best I can leave you with. So the data he's accused of destroying and sending away are the data that he sent to I can't say all the places he sent it, but one of them was the legislature that he sent it to. Hey, I uh, didn't get to hear the early part of the discussion, but uh, when you started at the beginning, somebody asked if frog dying is bad, and I just wanted to comment that one of there's a lot of far-reaching repercussions because frogs are so important in the ecosystem and the web of life. Um, so, for example, frogs dis disappearing could mean an increase in birds dying from West Nile. I mean, there's so many different ramifications that are impossible to trace. And I, I missed the beginning. I wondered if you mentioned anything about uh, chytrid fungus or chytrid fungus. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Yeah. I didn't mention chytrid fungus directly, but I have two people in my laboratory who study it. And one, study it. And one of the things we're looking at now is, no doubt, there are populations that chytrid gets introduced to and the, and the, and the die-offs are responsible, but one of the things that we're really looking at now is that populations are made more susceptible because of environment stressors and pesticide exposures like in our work that we talked about. And so chytrid, in addition to other bacteria, in addition to bacteria and other pathogens are one of the agents that we're looking at that animals may become frogs, may become more vulnerable to when they're exposed to these stressors. In the discussions of the EPA and the upper levels of political appointments, have you, are you familiar with the uh, debate 2000, science debate 2008, the proposal for that, for actually having the political candidates, presidential candidates, debating their knowledge of science and the implications of that. And this would be seemingly something that for you to be signed on with as a good topic to discuss, along with this. Is, yeah, that's <laughs> along with the issue of um, that model that we talked earlier, that I questioned about of your opinion saying, prove it's okay, yeah. as opposed to here, and the problems in transitioning to that, too. So there's a lot of stuff. There. Yeah. No, I, I am aware that there's been a suggestion that there be a debate um, on, on science issues. I have been aware of that. And I don't know how far up. I have personally met with um, and, and spoken with Al Gore, so I know he's aware of some of these things. And also John Kerry and Teresa Hines in their most recent book. Have written, have written about our stuff, but whether or not it would actually be this particular issue would become part of that debate, I don't know. Because it would be a good one, and they're looking for people of your stature to sign on with supporting it as well, mm -hmm. along with everybody else to sign on. It's Science Debate 2008, yeah. the website, and check it out. Oh, I wasn't aware of the website. A lot of, a lot of big guns on it, and okay. it would be a good one to look at. Uh, you take atrazine, you apply it to an organism or a system, and then you look at the, the 
effects. And how well is it understood at the cellular level? So you can say, okay, well, you know, at the, the lowest possible level, this is what's going on, and this is why it's bad. It seems that to be very convincing. Yeah, I only showed one slide on that because I didn't want to bore you and you know, get down into like the details, but uh, about a third of our lab now, not in frogs, but in human cell lineage, are looking at the molecular details. There are other laboratories as well. We published two papers this year looking at human cancer cell lines. There's at least four or five other papers that have looked at part of that mechanism in cells, and we just got scooped by a group at UCSF who've just published a really brilliant paper, in part claiming that we're wrong with some of our mechanisms. But to me, it doesn't matter. We're getting more and more of the details. So, um, I'm one of a few scientists who's really happy to be scooped. I'm just happy whenever I see that somebody else independently is coming up with the same stuff that we're coming up with. We're going to take a couple more questions. So what, what I want to comment on that I mentioned to you earlier um, is how come you're the only one standing up? Like when you Google atrazine, there, there's totally the syngenta side. They actually have better hits than you, by the way. <laughs> But it, there's your website, but there's no other researcher standing up and saying this. Why is that? I, I mean, I think it's where I was 10 years ago, that, it, that it's inherent in the culture of academia that you don't get involved, you put your science out there, and that's it. You just let it sit. But as I showed, and one of the reasons why I go through that, I showed it, look, there are 38 papers that aren't mine. There are 20 different laboratories. So whereas other scientists are doing it, putting it in the literature, they're following, um, the same following that I follow. Don't be an advocate and let the science speak for itself. So you don't promote your own work. You don't, and in many cases, it's looked down on when you're involved in public lectures and when you're publishing in places like, you know, we've had our stuff in Discover Magazine and things like that. In many cases, it's actually sort of looked down on by, by academics. It's not a part of academic culture that, you know, you shouldn't have a, you know, they'll look at me doing a presentation like this and go, oh, he's got an agenda. 